Hello and welcome to this uh, Facebook live session. Uh, we are uh, here today to discuss uh, Bloomsbury India publication by Iqbal Malhotra and with an introduction by Maruf Raza. It gives me great pleasure to welcome both, uh, both Maruf and Iqbal to this discussion, uh, which I think is playing out at a time, uh, you know, the, the book is coming out at a time when uh, clearly China is uh, in news and we are discussing it day in and day out. What are the motives? What is happening on the border? Do we understand what is happening on the border? Uh, every statement that the government is issuing and every statement that is coming from the Chinese side is, be, is being dissected, constructed, deconstructed, molded, remolded in multiple ways. Uh, because I think part of the problem is our own understanding of the situation. So I, I think it's a great opportunity to be discussing this book, uh, which traverses through the history all the way to the contemporary times. Uh, and uh, both Iqbal had done, I think, uh, a great job in whatever little I have read about the book in terms of mobilizing treasure trove of, uh, trove of information uh, and um, knowledge of what the historical context was in which a Sino-Indian relationship is ensconced in today. Uh, and uh, and um, all the way to the contemporary period. I am um, a Director of Studies at Observer Research Foundation and uh, I look forward uh, to have this, to be uh, taking this conversation forward. So let me, let me invite uh, Iqbal first and then Maruf to say brief introductory comments both about the book and how this book came about and what is this book, what does this book tell us about the contemporary time. So Iqbal, why don't you take this forward? Uh, thank you, Harsh. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have, uh, I'm over here because I have written this book, which is uh, called Red Fear, the China Threat, and which is due to be published by Bloomsbury sometime uh, by the end of August or early September this year. And the book uh, actually is a... ...between uh, China and India from the 15th century uh, right up to the 21st century today. And uh, the uh, book basically came about because uh, Maruf and I, Maruf Raza and I, uh, had written a book last year called um, uh, Kashmir's Untold Story Declassified. And in that book, we came across uh, some fascinating information about the Chinese invasion of Aksai Chin and the fact that China was a player in the uh, Kashmir conflict and had been a player in the Kashmir conflict since 1950. So uh, when the book uh, was released, uh, Bloomsbury came to me and said, uh, we'd like you to do another book. So I said, well, I want to do a book on uh, India and China. And they said, why China? Because I said, I feel it in my bones that uh, China is uh, going to be in the news next year. And China is the elephant in the room as far as the Kashmir conflict goes. So that's how this book came about. And uh, it's a long book. It's uh, 105,000 words. And Maruf has very kindly written the introduction to it. So I'll pass the, uh, the mic on metaphorically to Maruf so that he can talk about that. And then we can get into this discussion. OK. Uh, thank you, Iqbal. And thank you, Harsh. Um, it's very rare that you get to sit on a panel with two people that you have both worked with in one way or the other over the last several years, and both of whom I hold in very high intellectual regard. So uh, the book, as we all know now, is most likely going to be a bestseller because it has such a wealth of information about China, which has been in the eye of the storm in so many ways, internationally, because of the COVID virus, which President Trump has insisted on calling the Chinese virus. And uh, now with China uh, uh, putting its boots on, which until yesterday at least, we were told was completely Indian territory. But now a remark by the Indian Prime Minister has added a spin to it all. So really, India and China needs to be understood by understanding 
what are China's driving points at this point of time in history? Where does it cover some of that about, you know, the anger inside uh, post-1949 China when Mao Zedong became their supreme leader and how China wanted to settle scores on every front, either the colonial baggage that they were carrying because of the ex experience of the British giving them a very rough time before China became the PRC or what they saw in India as an extension of the British uh, Empire in a way. Uh, India, since it became independent, particularly Pandit Nehru wanted to shed his direct linkages with the Brits in a way that, that India had its own place in the world order and hence his obsession with non-alignment. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the forces of global geopolitics, the United States, Russia, and even a rising China would not make it so easy for India to carve its own space. The book covers a lot of that. It also covers the conflicts between, primarily between China and India, both at an ideological level and then the physical conflict of 1960, which has shadow on the Indian mind that it's still there. And it was in some ways the defining moment of Sino-Indian relations. Uh, currently, we are facing a situation which seems to have means of the past, but more importantly, the legacy of not having a defined boundary which leads to conflicts. And finally, and most importantly, where will China stand in the world order after the mess that the pandemic has created? Will China come out of it a winner? Or will China be pushed into a corner by the concert of democracies that is taking place under the American umbrella with the usuals joining hands with America? I think these are many of the questions that will keep coming up over the next few years. This book helps get us a perspective on many of those issues. And, and it's important to understand also that how China views the world, how China sees the challenges that lie ahead, and what are the benchmarks that the Chinese leadership have put for themselves. Ironically, 2020 was a year that was also put as a benchmark by President Xi Jinping that by 2020, they double the GDP that was there of 2010. That hasn't happened. And so there are pressures on China to deliver on other counts. And the Chinese leadership has started flexing its muscles from Taiwan to South China, South China Sea. And now on the Indian frontier from Kashmir. More of that as we go along, but that is broadly, uh, the book is very well researched. I mean, there's enough needs for you to go more into detail, those who wish to, but this is an authoritative document uh, as any you can find on the rise of China. Uh, thank you, Maruf, and thank you, Iqbal. But with that tantalizing, uh, you know, bits of information about the book that uh, Maruf has given us, Iqbal, can I just ask you to il just elaborate very briefly on four or five uh, you know, aspects of the book that you think are having relevance for the contemporary uh, debate that we are having with regard to China. What are those four or five things that you would think, that you think uh, you would need to know today? Arsh, the first issue uh, that is very important is that what is the basis of this Chinese claim over Aksai, Chin and Ladakh? Now, in up to 1947, the Aksai Chin and Ladakh was a part of Maharaja Hari Singh state of erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now the northernmost settlement of Aksai Chin that bordered Sinkiang, which at that point of time was more or less like an independent country being ruled by a local warlord called Sheng Shikai and which had been invaded by the Russians because Sinkiang provided the source of 
uranium and thorium and beryllium and molybdenum, which was vital for the Soviet nuclear program and which was uh, 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 being carried out in a facility called Selatinsk, just on the Soviet Thinkiang border. Now, this settlement uh, was called Haji Langar. It was the northernmost settlement at that point of time of the state of Jammu and Kashmir and the, the state of Sinkiang. Now, this Haji Langar is not a Mandarin term. Haji is a man who's done a Hajj, and Langar is a, is, a, is a free distribution of food in an eating hall, like you have Guru Ka Langar in all the Gurdwaras all over the world. So, Haji Langar is not a Mandarin term, it's not a Cantonese term, it's not a Mongolian term. It's not any Chinese term at all, not even Tibetan. And it's a Hindustani term. And it means the last place where you would get food served before you moved into Sinkiang. Now, the China, there are four uh, basic precepts of sovereignty. The first is that does your writ run over a particular territory in terms of that are you able to collect land revenue from the people who are cultivating different crops over there? Now, the Chinese fail on this account. The land revenue in all these areas was being collected by the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, Hari Singh. Secondly, was justice being dispensed to those subjects? The judicial officers of this erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir used to travel by horseback, and wherever there were disputes that had been uh, accumulating, they used to go and resolve them. The third was that, was what was the currency that was the medium of exchange in these areas? Now, I'll show you this coin, one rupee, silver rupee. This Indian rupee was the legal tender in Lhasa, in Kashgar, right up to 1950. Even it was legal tender even in the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir state. And fourthly, were any troops being recruited from the uh, region which is, on which sovereignty is being claimed? The Maharaja of Kashmir's... Um, uh, Armed forces had troops which were locally recruited from the Ladakhis. So on all these four counts, the Chinese failed. Now the question is that why were the Chinese there? We have heard this myth uh, which is being perpetuated into almost a truth that the Chinese were wanted to build a road into Tibet. Now this road was built from Sinkiang into a Tibetan place called Rutog. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting. In 2002, I went on a pilgrimage to Mount Kailash. And I drove from Lhasa to Mount Kailash, which is about uh, 300 kilometers uh, southeast of Rutog, which is where this, uh, where this Chinese road first came into being. So the distance between Rutog and Lhasa is 1,600 kilometers. Now, in 2002, when I drove from Lhasa, after the town of Shigatse, which is about uh, uh, two, three hundred kilometers from uh, Lhasa, the balance 1,000 kilometers was uh, dirt kacha roads. So if there were dirt kacha roads, which we traveled in, a, my wife and I traveled in a Toyota Land Cruiser, it took us four days to travel the 1,000 kilometers. So you can imagine that in 1950, there wouldn't have even have been this dirt kacha route. And how long would it have taken the Chinese PLA to travel from Rutog to uh, uh, Lhasa, maybe two years, not less than that. So what was the need to build this road to Rutog, which is being said that they had to go through Aksai chain. By Rutog, there's a place called Gartok, where there was an Indian Army company stationed permanently as the military escort for the Indian trading mission in uh, uh, Tibet. This company was monitoring activity in this entire region. There were U.S. spies in that region, CIA spies, who were based in uh, Kashgar and Tiva, the capital of Sinkiang. And Stalin wanted to eliminate all uh, activity in Sinkiang that could in some way uh, monitor or filter information about his nuclear program to the West because it was a very sensitive area. So he caught hold of Mao because it was very convenient. Stalin had lost 25 million Russians in the Second World War. Four to five million troops had died. And Stalin was reconstructing and building his country, and he was loath to send in more troops to secure Sinkiang and Tibet. So what did he do? He called all of Mao. He told Mao, look, I'll give you 40 aircraft. You fly 15,000 troops 
from uh, near Beijing into uh, uh, Xinjiang and secure Xinjiang. And uh, Mao did that for him. Then Stalin called Mao in December 1949 to Moscow and told him, look, you move your troops into, into uh, Tibet and uh, Xinjiang through this upside chin region uh, because we want to exploit all the minerals over there. Now, Stalin was kept captive almost by Mao for two months between December 49 and February 1950. And by the, uh, uh, I think, 12th of February 1950, the Sino-Soviet Pact on the Exploitation of Mineral Resources in Xinjiang was signed. Now, the most mineral-rich area of Xinjiang is the Tarim Basin. And this Tarim Basin borders the Aksai Chin, and Aksai Chin is a geographical uh, uh, construct of the ta Tarim Basin. And this Tarim Basin had uh, uranium or thorium or molybdenum or beryllium or petroleum, gold. So much for Prime Minister Nehru that he said that, look, this area is uh, not even a blade of grass grows there. But it was so rich, it was a resource-rich area. And Russian uh, geologists, hydrologists, and all manner of uh, scientists, they moved in to map the terrain through aerial mapping to find out <coughs> where these deposits were. So this was the real reason the Soviets were interested in exploiting the mineral resources of the Tarim Basin. And that's the reason why the Chinese moved in. And this whole pretext of the road was all rubbish by saying that they had to conquer Tibet. Tibet, they conquered much later. But they, by a slate of hand, they managed to, uh, uh, you know, get hold of Tibet by just entering the, uh, the eastern border and by entering the western border and uh, on the periphery of, of, of the place. So let me tell you one more very interesting thing that land revenue from the principality of Minsar, 10 kilometers away from Mount Kailash, which I have visited in 2002, was being paid to the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir in 1950. And Pandit Nehru gave this away to uh, the Chinese in 1954 in the famous Panchil Agreement. Now, everybody knows that uh, Lord Shiva's abode is Mount Kailash. And it's part of our heritage and culture. This was our land. And the fact is that there were no border stones or border markers in those times. But if land revenue is being paid, then that is an indication that, look, this was part of the kingdom of, uh, which was established by uh, Maharaja Gulab Singh. So this is the first important point is that there was this myth. Now we know that the Indian Army sent in a reconnaissance mission in 1952. General Karyapa, who was the CNC, he authorized this mission. And there was a Captain Nath, who later on became a major general in the Indian Army. He went in, and the Indian Army's border was the Lanakla Pass that bordered Tibet. Now, in order to get to the Lanakla Pass, you have to go through the Konkala Pass. Today, the Konkala Pass, the western end of the pass, is technically in the LAC because it is about north, uh, north, north of the Galwan Valley. But Indian Army cannot go and patrol there because that area has been taken over by the Chinese. So this Captain Nath went from through the Konkala Pass to the Lanakla Pass, and through the Lanakla Pass, he observed the road. Now, that mission of Captain Nath is still classified by the Indian government 68 years later. So, Prime Minister Nehru acquiesced to the encroachment of the Chinese because for Nehru, greater than the sovereignty of India, and I'm, I'm, I'm posing this question, was the uh, concept of non-alignment. And in order to <coughs> preserve the concept of non-alignment and expand it, he had to get the uh, a consent of the Chinese. So he said it's a perception that this is our land. The Chinese say there's a perception that it is their land and uh, not a blade of grass grows there. So why are we wasting our time defending it? And then later on, when public opinion became unpolitable and people made life hell for him, parliament, he then said, let's have the forward policy and let's go uh, into that area and let's claim it. But the essential point is that what I bring out in this book is that the Chinese had it in for us because they called us the tail of the British dog. Because for a hundred years from 1839 to 1939, the Indian army in one way or the other was the army of occupation in mainland China. The Indian army, which was officered by British officers, but Indian soldiers, they fought and they suppressed 
the Chinese in so many insurrections and rebellions in the 19th century and the 20th century. And this leadership of communist China hated the Indians because we, the famous uh, 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 Jamshedji Jiji boy and David Sassoon, they sold opium <clears throat> and this opium enslaved the entire Chinese population, made them into opium addicts. The term Afimchi comes from there because the Chinese were all Afimchis, all opium addicts. And the Chinese political leadership wanted retribution. They hated India. And they did not want India to rise because they viewed India as a threat because India had already dominated them. There were Indian policemen in uh, duty in Shanghai till 1949. There were Indian policemen in 10, 11 other Chinese cities. The Indian army was there. So all these factors... Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Iqbal. I, you know, I, I want to, these are fascinating uh, aspects and I wanted to sort of disentangle uh, some of them. Um, and um, uh, Ma Maruf, I think what, you know, the Iqbal has made two very, very interesting points that have very contemporary relevance. One is this debate on differing perceptions of LAC. You know, for we have been talking about this forever. Whenever there is a problem, the easiest way to resolve this, yes, there is a problem because there are differing perceptions of LAC. Uh, on the border and therefore it will continue. It, it, it wasn't there in the past. It will continue to be there in the future. Now, how do we take that conversation going forward, given that the historical record that Iqbal presents? Uh, do you think that this uh, and what has happened uh, this week and what has happened in, from May onwards? Do you think that that, that uh, aspect from Indian government's perspective uh, becomes a bit untenable, this argument, that perception of LAC, because clearly now there are going to be demands from various quarters that if there are, if, if at all this is about, simply about differing perceptions, then why has it escalated to this point? And why is it that Indian government continues to be on the defensive, whereas China continues to be on the offensive, if it is simply a question of differing perception? This, uh, I think this, this point uh, which Ibal raises, perhaps you can contextualize it in today's uh, context. Well, it's a, it's a very valid and a very relevant question. <clears throat> you see, the first thing to understand is China has its own sense of history. And because it has its own sense of history, it defines what belongs to China in a way that the high order in Peking, now Beijing, believes it does. For example, uh, let me give you the case of South China Sea. China claims they've had claim there from 223 BC. But they have a problem in acceptable arrangements that were there in the case of the India-Tibet-China boundary and initiatives that had come into being well in the, in the last <coughs> hundred years. So the Shimla Agreement of 1914, which was done at the time of Lord Curzon, who was the Indian Viceroy. And they'd got a gentleman in charge of it, whose name was Henry McMahon. And McMahon was an expert border demarcation uh, personality. He had made what is the boundary between Pakistan and Afghanistan called the Durand Line. He had actually mapped it out. So they gave him the job because at that point of time, Tibet was more powerful militarily than China. And the Chinese did try to and control out of the Tibetan plateau from where the Doklam standoff took place, Chumbi Valley and thereabouts. So Chinese representative came to agree on a boundary and the British aim was to define the boundary between Tibet and India because there was a boundary between Tibet and China also. Tibet was not a part of China. As Iqbal has brought out, from 1950s onwards, Chinese moved into Tibet. And amongst others, Pandit Nehru acknowledged China's uh, all its sovereignty or suzerainty I mean, these were words that were debated for many years at the United Nations debate about Tibet. But in the Panchin Agreement of 1954, which came to be known as the Panchin Agreement, but it's the, really the Peace and Tranquility Agreement. And in that, Tibet is very clearly mentioned 
government and signed as such as a part of China. So therefore, being a refugee, Minister Zhao in Lai, uh, in a number of letters that were exchanged in the Chinese and the Indian government, using the term LAC, the line of actual control. So the common knowledge is that from 1993 came the publicly used term between the agreements between India and China, uh, fostered from the time of Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and Deng Xiaoping. And that continues to be Thirteen and then provided we were willing to exchange in Aksai Chin. Now, where is Aksai Chin? Where is let me online? Look at the map of India as we have grown up looking at broadly. Aksai Chin is where the erstwhile state of Jammu Kashmir's eastern borders around Ladakh and beyond ran with Tibet, and coming down towards Nepal. Short of that, the line of actual control stops. But the Chinese haven't accepted that defined claim line of India or China. So there is that whole argument about what really belongs to whom. And therefore, I mentioned about the prime minister's statement today. The second major line is when you look at the map of India, it is Sikkim going on to Myanmar. That is the line called the McMahon line. Now on both these lines, after the Chinese attempts to settle a boundary with India were dismissed by Pandit Nehru, who used words to the effect to say that, that what is this line of actual consent to withdraw 20 kilometers from what they call the line of actual control? What is the line of actual control and words to that effect? I mean, there's all recorded evidence of that. So. Nehru by then had come under a lot, lot of political media and local pressure. So from initially trying to appease the Chinese in the 50s, he accepted Chinese suzerainty over Tibet, if not sovereignty. He pushed China's case for membership of the United Nations. He sidestepped in the seat being offered to India as Security Council member P5. But he gave it to China, said our time will come and various things. There are debates still going on about it. But the bottom line is when the Chinese found they were not getting much joy or luck with Pandit Nehru, then the conflict was initiated by Pandit uh, Chairman Mao to teach Nehru a lesson. For two, three reasons. Nehru's stature had become very big internationally, non-alignment and all that. Secondly, a lot of chest thumping that was happening in India, China decided to, Iqbal's brought out the baggage of the past that even Mao was carrying. And I remember in our discussions, Iqbal has said that the tutors of Mao and Shao and Lai were people who had seen Indian troops, Indian policemen marching through the streets of China. So there was that anger. They saw India as an extension of the Raj, as I mentioned to you earlier. So at that point of time, when he decided to teach India a lesson, the Chinese always look at an opportune time to do it. That attack in 62, which lasted exactly 30 days, took place during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world thought in October 62 that Russia and US were going to go over into a nuclear conflict because of the missiles deployed in Cuba. And there's a whole story to it. You're a professor of war studies. You'd know it better than all of us. But now again, the Chinese muscle flexing at a time when the world's attention is divided. So that's the background with which we need to understand. Now, there are three lines. Iqbal talked about this Haji Langar area. Now, when you look at a map of India, which all of us in India have grown up looking at, you see the northern, northernmost portion of India, where on the east, there's a shoulder that juts out. That shoulder area that juts out is based on a line drawn by a British cartographer whose name was Johnson. Now Johnson somehow came in touch with Maharaja of Kashmir, who gave him a post-retirement carrot, said extend my boundaries as far as you can. So Johnson drew a line, just like the map of India was being finalized. So this 
Nobody else went that far, so they accepted that line. The Chinese, when Chow En Lai came to India to make the offer in '59, he was looking at the McDonnell McCartney line. Now, the McDonnell McCartney line is halfway between Ladakh Plateau and the edge of the Johnson line, which Iqbal talked about, Haji Langar, and these two other passes, which he talked about, Indian patrols going there. This ran somewhere in between and was pretty much away from the Pongyongsu Lake and the Galwan Valley where the fighting and the tension is happening now. But as I said, Nehru dismissed him. So when the fighting took place, Chinese troops took us by surprise because till the very end, the Indian leadership believed that we'll never get attacked by China. But when I want to make a point here, Maruf, I want to interrupt you for a minute. I want to make a ah. point here that the reason why Chow and Lai did not accept that Johnson line was that the Karkash River, which is the uh, biggest river in Aksai Chin, it flows from Aksai Chin into the Tarim Basin, into the Tarim River. And the Karkash River and the Shaksikam River, which flows from the west to the east, are the two rivers that actually feed the Tarim River. And the Soviets determined that the end of the Tarim River flowed into Lake Lopnod. And that was to be the site of the Chinese nuclear testing program. And that yes. whole lake was going to get radioactive and get contaminated. But the rest of the uh, uh, Tarim Valley and the Tarim Basin was still very important for cultivation. <coughs> and where would the water come from? The water had to come from the Karkash River and from the Shaksgam River. So the reason was that draw a boundary or claim a boundary that encompasses the Karkash River into the Chinese side. And the, along the Karkash River, in the, because it was a glacial fed river, in the winter it was used as a route into Sinkiang. And along this route were all these minerals and there was jade and there was gold. In fact, in 1950, the Chinese were uh, uh, prospecting for gold in the Karkash River. So the, the river waters have played a very important role in this. Now I'll, then I'll take up this river waters again after Maru finishes his point. Okay, so this point is very well taken. And since Iqbal is more conversant with those details, I didn't go into it. But broadly speaking, the Chinese also made a claim on Aksai Chin by saying, your presence is not there physically, but our presence is there. And as Pandit Nehru has is an off-quoted statement of the last one week saying that there was not a blade of grass that grew there and somebody said that, you know, on many a bald head, not a blade of hair grows there. So are you going to give your hair, head away? But anyway, uh, that was on a lighter note. But more seriously, that because there was no Indian physical presence, the Chinese kept moving closer to what is now the area of the tension which is their claim line. And this claim line has come about for two reasons. One is the 62 conflict this line, which is much further west, closer to the Pangyongsu Lake, part of the Pangyongsu Lake, as we know, is with the Chinese, closer to the Galwan Valley and all that. So this became the Chinese claim line from 1962 up. onwards. And Huh? Yeah, and even good. during the war, even during the war, as we know, that there was a short ceasefire where the Chinese again wanted to talk and settle matters. But by then, Nehru was being pushed by many others and Arya Parki Ladai Larete. So therefore, uh, nothing was accepted. And post ceasefire, two things happened in the case of Aksai Chin. The Chinese had come actually from what I have understood up to the Galwan, well beyond the Penyongsu Lake towards the western side, towards the state of Jammu and Kashmir. But they went back to a line which became the acceptable LAC. And this LAC came into, and these were again maps and arrangements that were shown to Prime Minister Narsimara. It was shown to Prime Minister Vajpayee, uh, but I'm not alluding to say any of them agreed to it, but this Nasima Rao certainly agreed to the line of actual control as a formal terminology, and it was decided 
just like everything else is decided between India and its neighbors, at a suitable time, we will settle it. So that suitable time never comes. And we've had 22 rounds of high-level meetings between interlocutors. Maruf, I want to just... Uh, Maruf, I want to... That's just one thing. A high-level meeting between interlocutors, but nobody has got around to defining that line. And therefore, the tensions now is between encroaching Chinese troops who are wanting to say that this was always ours. And the Chinese always done it. You call it salami slice. You call it a land grab. You call it anything. They come there. So bottom line of my understanding is any territory with the Chinese, which is not physically held, the Chinese will lay claim to it by coming into it sooner or later. So that is what I'm alluding to, that get down to resolving the boundary. Otherwise, you'll have these kind of situations every year or maybe every alternate year. Iqbal, to you. Yeah, I just want Thank to make you. a point. Just, just, just very really briefly, Iqbal, I, I, I mean, uh, you can respond to, uh, to Maruf and, and also make your point. I just also would like you to briefly mention, uh, you know, discuss uh, uh, this issue of, um, uh, you know, Galvan Valley, which is, which is at the moment under, con under contestation and uh, how this sort of has become a flashpoint given that get the chinese maps themselves I, were not I was, going to, I was going to come to that you see the uh, there's a river which is the indus river and the indus river flows from tibet into ladakh and then into pok now this indus river has got five tributaries the shyok river the galwan river the chang chemo river the nubra river and there's uh, one more river i can't remember the name now, on the Indus River, the Chinese have built five dams from uh, around Gilgit. There is the Daimar Basha Dam, there is the Bunji Dam, there is the Dosa Dam, and there are two more other dams. Now, they are spending $25 billion on building these dams, and they are setting up huge 200-kilometer-long reservoirs to store water. Now, they want to ensure that the flow of water from Ladakh into POK is unimpeded. Now, in 2009, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh went to China and he objected to the dam's run of the river projects that China as an upper riparian state was building on the Brahmaputra River. And this was this has changed the ecology of uh, Assam. It's changed the ecology of Bangladesh and the entire Brahmaputra has shifted 15 kilometers away from its original riverbed. You can go to Assam and see it. So he objected to it. And he was the first prime minister to object to this fact. Now the Chinese are apprehensive and scared that possibly the government of India, which has under the Indus Waters Treaty, got the right to uh, tap 20% of the water of the Indus and its tributaries, will build run of the river projects, which will enable us to release and store water at will, which will affect the viability <coughs> or the efficacy of the five dams that they've built upstream in POK. So their aim is to actually, one way or the other, push us west of the Indus River so that this entire waterway is secured. And this is what the Pakistanis want as well. So this whole issue now is a war for water. And this Galwan Valley and the Galwan Heights overlook the junction of the merger of the, of the Galwan River with the Shyok River. And the Shyok River along it runs our DSBDO road that goes all the way up to Dalat Beg Oldi. Now, Dalat Beg Oldi is the highest airstrip in the world. It is very vulnerable because it is close to the Depsang Plains. In 1984, Indira Gandhi agreed to dominate the uh, Siachen Glacier and take possession of it. So the tri-junction, the deemed tri-junction of India, Pakistan and China, which was supposed to be the Karakoram Pass, was shifted 100 kilometers west to the Indira Kol, which is the northernmost part of India today. Now, the entire boundary between the Karagoram Pass and the uh, uh, Indira Kol is something coveted by the uh, Chinese. <coughs> so, by taking, by putting pressure on Dalat Beg Oldi, tomorrow if Dalat Beg Oldi collapses, then 60 kilometers by line of uh, flight of crow or line of sight, you've got the Siachen base camp. They can easily take over the Siachen base camp and ca catch our army into a pincer movement. So this domination of the Galwan Heights is strategically very important for the Chinese and it's very important for us to throw them away 
from the Galwan Heights because they dominate the road and they can they can interdict our supplies and our entire defense. So this. But but Iqbal, is, Iqbal, is this happening because they are looking at India becoming more efficient in infrastructure and coming closer to uh, what perhaps at one point India was not doing, and so therefore is that is that you know is that uh, the, the current crisis has has because you know they could have. When when India was not building that infrastructure, they were they could have been very very secure and safe and not becoming this aggressive. Suddenly now they have become they are becoming aggressive because India is also doing something which is making them uncomfortable. Is that one of the reasons? There are there are three reasons. One is this infrastructure reason. The second is that in the, within the next five years, all these dams are going to go on stream, and they need this water very badly for their semiconductor industry because there's a trade embargo the Americans have placed. On the supply of high-end microprocessors to China, and they've got a factory they've set up in Kashgar to manufacture polysilicon. One 30-centimeter wafer of silicon needs 10,000 liters of fresh water. They want this water of the Indus and its tributaries. And the third thing is that today India is in a disarray because our economy has gone down the tubes. We are losing the fight against COVID, and for some reason or the other, we don't have the stomach to face up to the Chinese. If we can turn the tables and sh and let the army show its guts, which it has, and we can give the Chinese hell for leather, they'll back off. <coughs> Maruf, uh, over to you. Uh, just very, very, very briefly. I I, I think we have, we will uh, have to conclude in ten ten odd minutes. Uh, going looking forward. Uh, you know uh, what are what are India's options here? I mean, we are we are discussing these days in India from boycotting China economically to um, you know building up our muscle to sort of diplomatic engagement. But most of them will have we have a long gestation period. You know, these are all long-term things that we can do. If the crisis escalates on the border, first of all, do you see this crisis escalating at the border? And if it does, then uh, then what are India's sort of more operational and tactical options here? Yeah, I would look at it in uh, with four dimensions. The first is the tactical, which you just asked. The second is the strategic. The third is the economic, and the fourth is the geostrategic. Now, I'm going to do just two-minute answers. The television type response to each of them. Tactical. The prime minister has indicated that India would respond. Now, if that happens, and he's also said he's given a free hand to the armed forces. The armed forces do have plans in place not to bang their head against a wall here, but to make gains elsewhere and to make China feel the pain. So it's not the army of 62, because that's a question that I, we've always asked as military historians, that how did this Indian army, which performed superbly in World War I, World War II, 47-48, then in 65 against Pakistan, then in 71, then in Kargil 1999, was completely caught napping in 62 because this army was not allowed to fight. And the politicians and many weak need generals led to the uh, uh, imbalance. The second thing is there are other tactical options which I don't want to go into details, but people like you and Iqbal would understand. The Sumdrongchu type option, which is without firing a shot, put China in a spot militarily on either frontier by moving troops quickly and surrounding one of their positions and say, we move from here. And there are positions where we are at an advantage. There are positions they are at an advantage. We will move from here if you pull back from Galwan to what was up till now an acceptable LAC. Then we go into the strategic option, which you are a professor of, but having come from the same institution as you, I've learned a few things there. And one of them is we have a very capable Navy and the naval option is not being ruled out in terms of putting pressure on China in the Straits of Malacca and the southern areas of the Indian subcontinent where Chinese a uh, lifeline of resources comes from the Gulf region and make them feel the pinch. China, in mat maritime terms, is not yet, they may be boasting of having a very large navy by in another five years, but today we still have the edge 
in and around the Indian subcontinent. So we can exercise that option. The third is the economic option. Now, this is all going to happen simultaneously as the temperature increases and the tensions build up. India is already talking of some economic steps. And the pinch will to China for restricting Chinese imports into India will not be that huge. But it is still could be in the range of 10 to 12 billion dollars of imports, which at a time like this, every economy values, even the Chinese economy. Otherwise, the Chinese state surplus with India, as you know, I mean, for this financial year, it's already in excess of 48 billion dollars, but it normally goes to 54, 56 billion dollars. So there is the trade dimension. There is also the geostrategic geopolitical dimension. There is a concert of democracies which is all ganging up against China and multiple pressure points are being created from the United States to Australia to Japan. China has upset a lot of people, even Southeast Asia, I read today in the papers, is looking at China again with anger. So those options, I think the Indian diplomatic core, though they are short staff, would be working towards to build up a consensus to corner China, just like China wanted to corner us and has in some ways with its string of pearls of ports around the Indian subcontinent, the Gwadar port, uh, the, the, I can't get the name right, the Burmese port with K. There is Hamban Dota in Sri Lanka. They're trying to build, you know, ties in Cox's Bazar and Bangladesh. They're almost bought out Nepal. So all those pressures are on us. So while the pressure is on us on the subcontinent, China may find its movement restricted in the Asian continent by these initiatives. So broadly speaking this, uh, I don't want to go into too much of detail because they'll take time and complicate things. But I would look at it in this way if I was sitting in South Block. Iqbal, the same question to you. And if you can conclude by sort of, uh, you know, uh, because many people would have asked you this question. If you look at the historical record of China, Sino in Indian engagement, uh, what what does it make you uh, you know does it make you pessimistic about sino in indian relations today and for the future how do you map this out this longer you know given your history how do you map the future uh harsh i'll just uh, conclude with this uh, saying uh, uh, basically the point is this that look the chinese are on a roll right now they are not going to stop uh, where they are today they are going to push to a resolution of this thing. There is a lot of speculation in the air that this was the message that uh, Mr. Xi Jinping con conveyed to the Prime Minister at the Mamlapuram summit in October. I mean, this is speculation. But he wanted a trilateral resolution of the Kashmir issue with India, Pakistan and China sitting down at the table and resolving it according to their, to their advantage and to their satisfaction. Now, we are talking about Indian territory. And we are talking about Indian waters. I mean, the entire uh, uh, Kailash Mansarovar area is a uh, home to Brahmaputra, the Indus, the Karnali, the Satluj. These are the, and it's the headwaters of the Ganges. This is our vital lifeline. How can we ever let the, give any <coughs> part of our rivers away? We have a right. In fact, Prime Minister Nehru, he just gave the, uh, the three northern rivers away to Pakistan. Pakistan has one-fifth the population and they've got more than 60% of our water by that unequal treaty of 1960. So we need to do some hard uh, thinking and we need to uh, build up our alliances and confront the Chinese because the Chinese will never be satisfied. After their experience that India supported with an alliance by a, a Western country, what they did to China in the 19th and 20th centuries, they want to make sure that that very India cannot do the same. And we have to ensure that we can do the same by building our alliances with Japan, with Australia, with the US, with Vietnam, and confront the Chinese. Because see, as Maru was talking about the Samdurong Chu incident, it was because of Samdurong Chu incident that the Chinese got scared. And Rajiv Gandhi, when he went to China to meet Deng Xiaoping, went there as an equal. And the Chinese were very interested in a border settlement because they looked at a resurgent India. At that time, the defense budget of India was 4% of the GDP. In Manmohan Singh's time, it had fallen to 2.5%. In Mr. Modi's time, it has fallen to under 2% of GDP.
but at that point of time in 89 the chinese were scared there was a working group set up after rajiv gandhi's meeting with deng xiaoping and that working group was uh, went through the period when india was at its weakest <clears throat> when there was a vp singh government when there was chandrashekar's government and narsimha rao was suddenly this concept was sprung into his lap that look we've got to get this lac done and form this border with china now my uncle lieutenant general p s bagat demarcated the loc uh, between india and pakistan with maps and he got the pakistani general to sign on the map with him so in 1993 why didn't these great uh, bureaucrats of the foreign office why didn't they get the chinese to sign on the maps that this is the lac why leave it to perception you left it to perception in 1954 and again in 1993 you leave it to perception 40 years later didn't you learn anything <clears throat> so with the chinese it has to be cast iron nothing vague and as maru said you've got to dominate those areas you've got to ensure get israeli help get american help set up sensors spend money and almost convert the lac to the loc because they are eyeing your waters and they are eyeing your land and they will not stop thank you thank you ikbal thank you maruf these are very very uh, very for a very interesting discussion and i must say that you know the the, the history the historical record uh, of sino indian relations is a very important one which all of us should be more aware of more cognizant of uh, and uh, i'm just being told that there are some comments if we can take um, uh, i think if if you have some time can we take some comments ikbal yeah yeah some we can take comments yeah. Yeah. so uh, the, there is uh ankur ankur is staggering but uh, it's too much it's, it's so much to take in fascinating uh, there is much to take in amazing wealth of information uh, so these are just words of appreciation for you uh, ikbal <laughs> thank you uh, thank you um, Uh, so thank you all thank you both uh, and thank you uh, namrata for uh, setting this up uh, it was wonderful and hopefully everyone will read this and and, and uh, may you write uh, more best sellers both of you uh, and uh, i think military history is something that that perhaps we need to read more and we need to understand more the historical context of our contemporary uh, evolution thank you thank you do me for bringing this thank you maru thank you ikbal thank you maru thank you very much